Hey everyone, welcome to another edition of Power Core Productions and Podcastings. I'm your host, Javon Harrington, back to hit you with another video. And today, we are going to be starting a brand new series on the channel, one that you guys have been looking forward to since its OP dropped about a week ago, and that is none other than What If Issei Was the Ghost Rider High School DxD Spirit of Vengeance Season 1 Part 1. But as always, before we get into today's video, if you haven't, then please don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, share, and hit that bell for post notifications so you can stay up to date on everything that is Power Core Productions and Podcastings, and also so that you can check that community tab so that you can always stay up to date when news and information drops. Also, if you haven't already, then please check out our previous uploads from earlier in the week and make sure that you always stay caught up on the stories so that you can always be involved as we continue on with the channel as we are on the road to 2k and beyond now getting into this story i have taken into consideration a lot of what you guys have been offering and suggesting and i hope that i have come up with something that you guys can truly enjoy yes this is a marvel based what if story and I do have connections going into the future to go greater into detail about it. So make sure you check out other series on the channel such as What If Tanjiro Had Venom and What If Naruto Was Trained by Doctor Strange and the series that I believe personally started it all, What If Spider-Man Was in ReZero. All of these will play a part similar to how all of the Power Rangers series play a part and I do hope to be getting back into that series soon. So make sure you stay tuned for that as well. But anyway, without further ado, we are going to get straight into today's video as you guys have been waiting for it long enough. So as always, sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Our story begins with a boy and a girl. The boy's name was Issei Hiyoto, and the girl's name was Irina Shido. The two were childhood friends, inseparable, while different in every way. Issei, a pervy horn dog of a child who loved women. And everything about them. And Irina, a good, kind hearted girl who believed in strong moral values. They were opposites in every way, and under normal circumstances, you would believe that the two of them could never get along. But you would be wrong in that case. They were the best of friends, even if they had differing opinions on one another. They would always play and hang out and they were inseparable and their strength and their friendship would be tested beyond compare it all started when Issei was 12 years old Irina 11 respectively her parents had gone out of town on a trip last minute and they asked the Hyodos to watch over their daughter but little did they know that this would be the last time that they would ever see one another again for tragically, Irina's parents would pass away. The circumstances surrounding their death would never be made public as little could be done to explain. The best that they could come up with was that they were in some sort of a freak accident and they both died. Irina was devastated, but Issei was there for her in her hour of need. With no other family and nowhere else to go, the Hyoto family took Irina into their home, making her a part of the family. Issei in that time, he grew a lot closer to Irina. 
Of course, the two of them still remained good friends. Irina, appreciating the Hyoto family for everything that they had done for her. As they grew older, Issei and Irina developed into being who you would know them to be today. Issei still retained his love for women. And Irina, she was always there to rebuke him whenever he took his perversions too far. Although deep down, even she had to admit that there was a fondness for Issei. While most people saw it as a bad thing, and Irina was quick to agree, she understood Issei. She knew who he was deep down inside. She knew he was kind, caring, loyal, and trustworthy, and that she could always rely on him whenever she needed to. As they grew older, Issei developed another hobby that he enjoyed with Irina. Irina was always fond of cars. She liked to observe them, to watch them drive. She even enjoyed going to the racetrack from time to time. Issei, by being close, also kind of developed a feeling for cars. Not to the extent that Irina did. She truly did just enjoy riding and seeing the countryside. Something more peaceful. For Issei, he enjoyed a good car ride as much as the next. But he also saw cars as an opportunity. An opportunity to get with girls. It was his one motivation. And Irina even had to admit, when it came to that motivation, he was capable of doing things. He was even able to get his license at a reasonable age. And he worked many odd jobs to save up money for his first car. Although, he was only able to buy an old one. A little beat up, but a little paint would help it out. It was a classic in many ways. A 1965 Ford Mustang. Black with silver trim. For Issei, it took many painstaking hours. Many months of working non-stop. A lot of times he didn't get to hang out with Motohama or Matsuda. Although, he was probably better off anyway. Seeing as how they never made that much progress to begin with. Eventually his car would take in the full form. And he did have a leg up when he started his schooling at Kuo Academy, both he and Irina respectively. But alas, even with the car, it didn't mean that the girls came any quicker. And by second year, Issei was still stuck in the same rut, as he, Motohama, and Matsuda were sitting out on the grass of the school hills, watching as the students were going on their daily business. Issei couldn't help but wonder why on earth he came here in the first place. But then he was quickly reminded that it was only a couple of years ago that the school had actually become co-ed, and thus allowing for both males and females to go to the same academy. Of course, he went there under the impression that all of the changes and modifications that he had made to himself would allow him to get a girlfriend any quicker. But that didn't prove to be the case at all. As Motohama and Matsuda were getting ready to leave, Issei still had to wait since Irina was the person he had to take home, and she often stayed back whenever she had some club activity that she needed to do. The boys were already talking about their next meeting spot for whatever girls they were going to try to hit on, and Issei wished he could have gone, but he was loyal to a fault, and he never liked to leave Irina anywhere that could be dangerous. As his friends would bid him a farewell, Issei would go to the parking lot, resting beside his car as the sun was beginning to set. He didn't really have much to do that day, and he thought maybe if he could get Irina home soon enough, then maybe he could get back out and hang out with the boys. However, as he was sitting by his car, a girl that he had never seen before would go up towards him. She had a different school uniform long dark hair and very shining eyes almost like that of a violet 
as she walked towards Issei. She would shyly introduce herself as Yuma, stating that she had seen Issei for a while now and that she had always thought he was kind of cute and she really wanted him to be her boyfriend. For Issei, this was not what he was expecting. A cute girl, nice body, everything he liked. And what's more, she actually approached him. This definitely took him for a surprise. Issei had never thought that any girl would be interested in him in this way. As the two continued to talk, Irina would come from the school. Walking towards the car, she would happily introduce herself to Yuma. The two girls seemingly getting along right off the bat. Yuma gave off this personality, this charm, as if she were just so kind and unique. For Issei, he was happy not only to have a girl that liked him, but that both she and Irina were getting along also. He felt as though now maybe things were going to look up after all. However, from a distance, there would be a young girl with white hair. As she ate from a candy bar, she was observing and she had been under orders from her master, a girl by the name of Rius Grimmery. As time passed, Issei and Yuma would get closer and closer together. But not just Issei and Yuma, it would also be Irina and the rest of the family as well. Yuma would visit often, and she was often the life of the meaning. Everyone was always happy to see her around. Issei's parents in awe that their son had actually managed to get a decent girl, and that it seemed to be changing him for the better. Of course, he still had his misgivings, but they could always see the good in their son at least. And for Issei, he felt as though everything were but a dream. Things had to be too good to be true. One night, Yuma had asked if she could spend the night with Irina. For Issei, he thought that this was finally going to be the opportunity to get some alone time with her. And Yuma would kindly tease him telling him that they were going to have their fun, but she really didn't want to hang out with Irina, and everyone was welcome to it. And that night, Yuma would come over to stay. She brought her bag, and she would go and set things up in Irina's room. Issei sitting in his room, he was mightily excited. He couldn't have asked for a better day. And now it felt as though he were heading towards the grand finale. Something he was definitely looking forward to. Everything went well that night as always. The dinner was lovely. The conversation was brightful and full of life. Eventually everyone went their separate ways. Issei didn't want to push or force anything. He wasn't that prude. He never wanted a girl to feel uncomfortable around him. As such, he went to his room and decided that Yuma would come when she was ready. And with that, Issei would walk into his room. However, as he did so, a sleeping fog would come over him. The next thing he knew, he would find himself passed out. Everything would be dark in that moment. Issei would slowly get his bearings back together. As he would lift his eyes, he could feel an intense heat completely surrounding him. He felt as though he were in an inferno. He wondered if someone had left the heat on for too long, he wasn't entirely sure. However, as he started to wake up, he would begin to choke and to cough. He could feel that there was smoke all around him. He could see the darkness beginning to puff throughout the rooms as there were flames dancing all throughout his walls. It didn't take Issei long to realize that the house was on fire. Issei would jolt up immediately, trying to hold in his breath as he went towards the door, kicking it open only to be met with more flame. As he ran through the house, Issei would yell towards his parents, to Irina, to Yuma, 
to make sure they were all all right. As he went through the rooms, trying his best to see through the smog and to see through the flames as the darkness began to surround them. He would make his way to the closest room, his parents' room. However, all he saw was burning, darkness, destruction. He couldn't find them anywhere. He continued to look on until eventually he heard a scream. As he went into the living room, what he saw next would be what would change him for life. He would see what appeared to be Yuma, except she was dressed in something rather seductive, and she had wings, dark wings. Issei was trying to figure out what on earth was going on here. I mean, yeah, she looked hot, but that really wasn't the important thing right now. She looked like a demon, a monster. And what was worse, she was holding Irina by the throat. <coughs> Yuma! Irina! <coughs> What's going on? You <coughs> say? Hmm. So, it seems I didn't give you enough of that drug, huh? I didn't expect you to wake up so soon, Issei. <coughs> Yuma! <coughs> What's going on? Why are you holding Irina like that? My, my. You weren't supposed to see any of this. You and your parents were supposed to die peacefully. I was only after Irina here. And I'll ask you one last time. Where is it? I... I don't know what you're talking about! Playing dumb, huh? Even you cannot be this foolish. The power, the sacred gear... If anything, you're too dangerous to be left alive. Issei would look up to see Irina preparing to be impaled by a weapon of light. In the last moment, Issei would grab a broken leg from a chair and smash it straight into Yuma's head. Ow! That little... You know, it's not nice to hit a girl like that. Screw you! Come on, Irina, we gotta get out of here! The two of them would rush out of the house immediately as they turned back to see the flames completely burning through. Issei knew that his parents in all likelihood were dead. He was already filled with enough sadness. He could see that Irina had been hurt and bruised a little. As they got inside of his car, they quickly piled out of the driveway and began speeding down the road. They had no idea what was going on, no idea what was happening. They just knew they had to put some distance between them and whatever Yuma had turned into. But in a cruel twist of fate, as Issei looked into the side mirror, he could see something fast and black heading straight towards him. Wings flying in the air. It was Yuma. As she formed a spear of light, she would aim it directly at the tail of the car, hitting it straight on and causing the car to veer and shake on the road. Issei tried to gain control, Irina crying and begging Issei to do something. Issei tried his best to get the car under control, and he did for a moment. However, another attack would render all of his efforts useless. As the car went spiraling and tumbling on the road itself, being wrecked and destroyed in the process with the two young teens inside. They would eventually go crashing for at least 30 feet before the car was eventually flipped on top of its head as Issei and Irina lay upside down. Issei would move over towards her, checking to see if she was alright. He could feel his arm and leg were completely broken and he knew there wasn't much that he could do. 
but all the same, he used whatever strength he had left to get himself out. Thankfully, his door was able to open. After carefully removing Irina, who was only barely conscious, he would hold her up and help pull her out of the wreckage. The two of them slowly began to limp and crawl their way out as they would hear a sinister laugh from behind them. They would turn to see Yuma as she had another spear of light at the ray. She threw it straight towards Irina to try to kill her. However, Issei was jumping away at the last moment being speared in the heart. Even though he was killed, the attack would still go through and hit Irina as well. The two of them lying upon one another collapsed on the ground as burning rubble and debris could be seen all around them. Yuma would remark that her job was done and with that she would fly into the night. Issei would be left terrified, alone, and afraid. He would look and he would see that Irina was, she was gone. And he knew that he wasn't too far behind. There was nothing that he could do in that moment. He looked up into the night sky itself. It was starless and there was no moon. As he stared into the pitch black with what little strength he had left, he called out. If there was anyone, if there was anything in this world that could save Irina, he begged that they do so. He would do anything. He would give anything. Just please save her life. As Issei would slowly collapse, his life now being drained from his body. His call did not fall on death ears. From out of the fire, a woman would walk forth. She was beautiful in every way as she wore red heels along with a crimson red dress. Her hair as dark and as black as the night sky itself. Her lips donned with that of crimson. Her skin as pale and as white as snow. And yet her beauty was something that could not be surmised. As she walked forward and knelt before Issei, her hand caressing his bruised and bleeding face. Her hand was as soft as that of a newborn baby's skin and yet as tender and as inviting. She would look down upon Issei for this is what she had wanted, what she had long since seen. Just then, a light would descend from the sky itself as a man in white robe would appear. The woman and the man would come face to face they knew that this was destiny, that these two children's lives were about to change in ways that could never be undone. My, 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 what do we have here this fine night? I didn't think that you would come so soon. And you, Michael. To what do I owe the special pleasure? I've come to save the girl. And not the boy. I can save him. But unfortunately the girl takes top priority. I'm sure she does. 
I guess it is her sacred gear then that you are after? Her parents were devote until the very end. They had done what they had done to keep their child safe, but all the same, if they were still able to be found after all these years, then it means that we were on borrowed time anyway. I see. So, you will take the Empress to heaven? That is what I intend to do. But what are you going to do to the boy? I have my own uses for him. Lady Mephisto, we have not been at war since the last great battle over a millennia ago, and our forces are still recovering. If you are plotting something, I am not. It is quite rude of you to assume such a thing. I do apologize. But do you really intend to give him that power? He will never be the same after that. Vengeance. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. <laughs> I'm sorry, but your notion of vengeance, well, it's a little too slow for my taste. And I have seen beforehand. I know what future lies for this young child. If this world that you wish to protect so much is truly to fall into darkness and despair, then he will need every bit of my essence. Then what will we do in the meantime? We will have to make it appear as an accident. I would wish that you not tell the boy about where I am taking her for the meantime. I see. Afraid he will come for you? I know he will. And I see that there is still much good in him. I do not wish to put them into a compromising situation where they will be on opposite sides. Well, we cannot always get everything we want. But I will respect your wish, if you respect mine. Give me the boy. With a nod, the two entities would take each child respectively. The woman would summon a servant that would take Issei. And as for the man, with his white wings protruding from either side of his back, he would pick up the young girl and ascend high above into the great sky. And as for the woman, she would descend down below. Issei Hiyodo, you who have suffered great loss and great despair, I breathe into you new life. You will become my spirit of vengeance. And you are the one who will carry out my justice. In the name of Zarathos, I summon you to live again. Issei would awaken once more. He would find himself in a room. He had no way of knowing how he had gotten there. It didn't look anything like where he had lived before. He wondered if everything he had been through had been merely a dream. As he looked around, 
you would see that beside him was a man in a black suit. He wore shades so that Issei could not see his eyes, his hair jet black. As he slowly rose, he would put away the newspaper that he was reading before handing Issei a glass of water. My, my, my. You took a while to wake up, kid. <clears throat> what happened? You happened. That's what happened. Who are you? Where am I? How did I... Enough with all the questions, kid. Drink the water. But I drink. Issei would do as he was instructed, as the man would go and make a quick phone call. Before he would reach for a bag, he would throw it at Issei's bed. He would tell him to get dressed and to follow him. Issei did as he was told, and the two of them would quickly leave from whatever building they were at. As they got into the car, the man would drive off immediately without hesitation, Issei not even getting a chance to put on his seatbelt as they went flying down the street. It seemed as though it was still nighttime, but for Issei, he had no idea just how much time it passed for him in the real world. They eventually made their way to the city, before stopping in front of a building. On the sign, it was called the Red Kavana. Issei had no idea that they would be taken to a place like this. He had heard of the Red Kavana, a place where one's dreams and desires could be met. And while Issei under normal circumstances would be excited, there were too many other things on his mind for him to think about that. However, the driver would quickly get out of his seat, handing his keys to the valet before grabbing Issei and taking him to the front. As the bouncer stopped them, for the first time Issei would hear his name. ID? You really gonna do this, Frank? You know who I am. ID. <sighs> Whatever. He reached into his coat pocket and pulled out an ID. On it, he read the name, Danny Ketch. After checking it over, he would be given his ID back and the two of them would make their way inside. Issei would see all of the vices. He would see the music blaring, the women dancing, the drinks being poured and everyone having a good time. The man would make sure that Issei stayed close and didn't stray too far as they made their way upstairs. They would go through many of the various halls until eventually coming to a main door at the end. The two of them walked forward and without a second thought the door would be opened. Inside Issei would see a room. He would see that it was elegantly made and designed carpet completely refurbished, furniture, a love bed. He would see a table with champagne on ice, two cups, rose petals all throughout the floor, candles being burned, the fragrance, a smell, one that was that of Strawberry. As they made their way in, they would be greeted by a woman who would be sitting in a chair in front of a desk. She would usher them forth and Issei would be sat down in the chair in front of the desk. That is all, Danny. You're free to go. Thank you, ma'am. Oh, uh, do I... Don't worry about him, Issei. He's an old friend. How do you know my name? I know a lot about you, Issei. More than you think. What? 
Why am I here? What's going on? Where's Irina? My, my parents? All I will answer. But first, did, what do you know about the girl that you call Yuma? You, Yuma, she, she, tr she tried to, to kill you? Oh, she didn't try. She did. Wait. I died? But how am I? How are you still alive? You say, darling, in this world, there are many things. Things that you might consider unordinary and unnatural. Well, let's just say you've now entered into a reality where the only limits are your imagination. But if I... Then that means Irina. Where is she? What happened to her? My family, everyone... They are all dead, Issei. What? They are dead. Gone. Not to be seen from again. But I... No. This can't be. You... Yeah. It's alright, Issei. No, it's not alright. My family... They're all gone. How can you say it's alright? I can't be here right now. Issei, you need to sit. I can't sit. I'm sorry, but I've got to... Before Issei could leave his chair, he found himself being pushed back down once again. The woman standing in front of him had done so with the flick of her wrist. Issei, when I'm talking, do not interrupt. Issei could feel a twinge of dread running through him. Whatever this woman was, she wasn't natural. No, not even close. As he looked there into her eyes, he could tell without a shadow of a doubt that he was in no position to speak out of turn. Good boy. Issei, the reason why you live again is because of me. I have gone by many names in my lifetime. I've mostly been named Mephisto, but I feel that name could be too forward, if you will. So, I prefer you call me Madame Fisso. Madame Fisso. Good. Issei. I have given you something. Something that will allow you to live again. Something that will give you a purpose. A purpose? Yes. One greater than what you already have. You see, I can bestow upon those who I deem worthy a great power, one that will allow you to rival even the gods themselves. I see. What exactly is this? It is known as the spirit of vengeance. You feel it inside of you, do you not? That flame that burns within your bones. That darkness that dwells within your heart. That anger that makes up your soul. You feel it when you take a breath. 
You feel it when you blink. When you go to sleep and when you awaken, a burning heat inside of you, one that you cannot extinguish. Issei, from this moment forward, I would like you to be my ghost rider. Your ghost rider? That is the title that's been given, yes. The ghost rider, or the spirit of vengeance, it is a force that is used to carry out divine judgment from the beginning of time. The power that I have given you will enable you to be that vengeance. You will be its living and breathing incarnation. And why exactly would you give it to me? Because I have seen your future. And for the sake of the world, and for your own mortality, you will need this power. No offense, it kind of feels like I'm making a deal with the devil. Oh, there are many devils in this world, Issei. And I assure you, there are a lot more of them out there, a lot more ruthless than I am. Then what was Yuma? What kind of demon is she? A demon? I wouldn't go that far. She's a many of things. But a demon, not necessarily. She is what we would call a fallen angel. A fallen angel? Lady Mephisto will explain to Issei the history of the world, that of the angels, the devils, and the fallen angels, and that what Issei had come into contact with was a fallen angel, most likely rogue and working of her own accord. But all the same, her actions resulted in the death of Issei's parents and in Irina. For Issei, his blood was truly beginning to boil. The rage that he was starting to fill inside of himself. The intensity and the heat. Thinking of the lies, the betrayals. He could feel the spark beginning to form within himself. And this was exactly what she wanted to see. When she was finished explaining everything to Issei, now came the parameters of his job. She knew that he wanted vengeance. Anyone possessed by the spirit did. He was a force of nature. But all the same, he did have a role that he needed to fulfill. She needed souls. Lots of them. And the only way that Issei could keep his power was to supply her with souls. Where and how he got them, she didn't care. He could do anything he needed to do, but she needed those souls. And she made it very clear that Issei belonged to her, and that under no circumstances would he belong to anyone else. With their meeting now concluded, Danny would step into the room once again to take Issei outside. As they stepped out, Danny would explain that he wasn't going to be driving Issei home. Issei was going to have to take himself. When he asked how he was going to do so, he would see that his car had been restored. Almost better than it was originally. Everything was completely retooled and refitted. As he got inside the car once again, Danny would slip him a note 
That would be the address for his new apartment where he would be living at. If he wanted to have the funeral, it would be held at his own discretion. And that in all likelihood, the banks would probably be getting into contact with him soon enough about the will and everything else following his parents passing. As far as he was concerned, he would still go to school if he wished to. But whenever there was a situation, he would be getting into contact with them. And when he got into contact, Issei needed to respond. With that, Issei would get behind the wheel of his car and he would make the drive back home to his town in Kuo trying to pick up the pieces that was his life. As he drove down the road, the darkness forming around him, he would take the time to see just how long he had been unconscious for. It had been three days, three days since the attack. As Issei made his way back into town, he would drive to where his house had been burnt. He could see that it had been taped off as he slowly made his way past the caution tape, walking through the rubbles and the remains. He would try to salvage whatever he could. He was only able to find a small box worth of things. He came across a picture though, one of he and Irina and the rest of the family. A single tear began to fall down his face as he started to think to himself. He started to reminisce. Why did it have to be this way? Why did they have to die? It wasn't fair. It wasn't right. However, he wouldn't have too long to think of that though. As another being would appear behind him. A man dressed in a trench coat and in a fedora. He too had dark wings as he looked to see Issei standing there. Hmm. <laughs> so... You still live, do you not? Just who the hell are you? My name is Donna Seek, and I can sense that you are nothing more but a stray devil with no master. Those wings, you're a part of them, aren't you? The fallen angels. Indeed I am. Where is she? Who? Yuma, where is she? Do you mean Lady Rainer? I don't give a damn what you call her. Where is she? Hm. You got a lot of nerve talking to me like that, kid. As if I would ever tell you anything. Issei would start to become more angry as steam started to emit from his body. It started to radiate off of his jacket as he walked forward, and the fallen angel making pace as well until the two of them were standing face to face. I'm only gonna tell you one more time. You tell me where she is. <laughs> And just what are you going to do about it? A spark of flame would form around Issei. His skin beginning to graft off until only his skeleton remained. The burning hell flame starting to radiate from around his entire body. The forceful energy pushing Donasik back a couple of feet. Knocking him on the ground. And just what the hell are you? I'm vengeance. 
Issei would immediately launch himself towards Donasik, his face completely disintegrating into that of the flame. Nothing, nothing remained but the skull surrounded by the fire. Donasik would attempt to fly back into the air, but before he could, Issei would grab him by the leg, slamming him straight into the ground. Donasik attempted to kick Issei away, but it only lasted for a brief moment, as Issei would grab him by the wing, crushing it as he could feel the bones snapping within his hand. Donasik would yell out, cursing Issei, thinking that he had the right to grab him. As Donasik attempted to throw a punch, Issei would easily catch it, his senses being heightened almost exponentially as he kicked him in the chest once more into the rubble. The two of them would start their fight. <sighs> you. So you're the one. The one that that damn devil blessed with that power. Tell me where she is. Now! I don't have to answer to you. Just burn in hell! Don Seek would create an energy blast, directing it straight towards Issei, shooting him directly in the chest and blasting him straight into the side of his car. Don Seek attempted to fly away, and it seemed as though he were making quick ground. Issei, however, would hop into his black Mustang and would drive off after him. The moment he got inside, the energy, the aura of his presence, would be enveloped in the car as it went racing down the road, leaving black marks in its way. The wheels looking as if they were set on fire. He looked as if he was something straight out of hell itself. The ground, the road, everything else being left in nothing but paved hellfire. As Issei's car went revving, blazing straight towards the fallen angel. Don Seek attempted to escape as quickly as he could. However, Issei would tie one of his shoelaces directly to the gas pedal of the car to keep it going forward as he crawled out of the window and sat on the hood. He would continue bellowing as he went straight towards Donasik before eventually getting enough speed. He would jump off the car and went flying straight into the air as he tackled him to the ground. The moment they went crashing back, the car would continue its onslaught moving directly towards them. Issei, however, would hold Donasik in a full Nelson lock, not allowing him to escape. The car was getting ready to ram straight into the both of them, and Issei was prepared to take the hit full on. The car would eventually crash in between the two of them, and they both went flying, Donasik taking the brunt of the attack as they went skidding right across the ground itself, almost a hundred feet. Donasik's wings, they grazed against the ground constantly until they were nothing left but bloody, black, feathery stumps. He would yell out in agony. He felt his wings as if they had been put through a grater. Issei, however, would slowly get up and recover. As Donasik could feel the bones within his body being crushed, he would cough up his own blood as he tried to crawl and walk away. An immense amount of fear started to take over him. He didn't like this feeling. This feeling of dread, of terror. As this ghostly and ghastly being slowly stalked him. He crawled into an alleyway. Begging, pleading, asking for anyone to save him. As he reached the dead end, with nowhere to go. He would turn back to see... Issei blocking his only way out. As the skull monstrosity cornered him. As Donasik looked into its hollow eyes. He was instantly filled with pain and regret. Issei unknowingly causing these very emotions. His very stare filling him with the shame and with the agony of all of those of whom he had killed. Whether they be devil or angel. Let me go. Let me go. 
Please, I'm sorry. I'll, I'll, I'll betray her. I'll help you. Just please let me go. I'll do anything. Anything, please. Anything? Fine. There's only one thing I want from you. What? What is it? Tell me. Please. Bring my family back. Can you do that for me? Huh? I, I, I thought so. Wait. Please. No! Those would be the last words that the fallen angel would say. What remained of his body was nothing but ash and bone. Whatever it once was, nothing would even be able to recognize it. As Issei left the remains of the fallen one, he went back into his car and what happened after that was nothing more but a blur. He didn't remember what came next. The next thing he knew he was awakening in his bed. Now in his new apartment, alone with nowhere else to go. He wondered if what had happened last night had been a dream. If it had been some sick and twisted fantasy. However, as he got up and he looked into the mirror, he would see within his own eyes until eventually he was staring back within himself. And he could tell without a shadow of a doubt that it had been no dream. This was his new reality, his new fate. Whatever he had become, he wasn't human anymore. And maybe that was for the best. Because now, there was only one thing that mattered to him. Finding Rainer. And he would go through every fallen angel to get to her. After some time, the funeral would be held. It was a small visual. Issei and a few of his friends had come by to check on him and make sure that he was alright. Motohama and Matsuda especially. Issei put up a fake smile for them, but he knew that things would never be the same after this. He started to skip school more and more. It really didn't matter to him all that much. As he got used to his powers, trying to test and push his limits, Whenever the time came, he would be given a phone call. There would be a stray devil here, a fallen angel there. Issei only went through the motions as none of it really mattered to him. The only thing he cared about was finding Rainer, finding that fallen angel. However, Issei's actions did not go unnoticed. Rius Grimmery would call a meeting with her other pieces as they had to go over the reports of this ghost-like being, a flaming skull of a man roaming about the streets of their town. He hadn't done anything wrong, technically. In fact, he had helped them out, whether he knew it or not, a great deal, taking out many of the other fallen angels and devils that went rogue within their territory. However, Rius, she couldn't let this slide. Deep down, she felt as though she were responsible. She had been keeping a close eye on Issei, but she let her guard down for one moment and now this happened. Issei had been taken over by a spirit, and there was no telling whose side he would be on or for how long. They knew they needed to find him, but that was a little easier said than done, as he seemed to stop coming to school all that much, and his whereabouts were mainly unknown. 
As for Issei, he was out in front of the parking lot of a cafe. He had stopped to get a drink and to clear his head. He didn't really get much sleep last night. As he did so, a girl would be walking across the road towards the cafe. However, as she did so, she would trip and fall, and a bit of her skirt had been lifted in that moment. Even with all of the things that Issei was going through, his love for women had never died. It took a back burner, but it never died. But although, he chose to be respectful and he helped her back onto her feet. As he did so, he would get a good look at her. She was pretty cute. Long blonde hair, dazzling emerald eyes, a cross around her neck and she was dressed like that of a nun. Issei would help her up and introduce himself, and she would thank him in kind, as she would give her name to him. Her name was Asia Argento. This concludes, what if Issei was the Ghost Rider? High School DxD, Spirit of Vengeance, Season 1, Part 1. But as always, if you enjoyed today's video, then please don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, share, and hit that bell for post notifications so you can stay up to date on everything that is Power Core Productions and Podcastings that has to come out now and in the future. That's going to do it for the end of the weekly uploads. Stay tuned for next week on Monday when we will be continuing with What If Issei Was the Shield Hero, High School DxD, Dragon's Rage, Season 2, Part 3, the Season 2 Finale. But anyway, that's going to do it for the end of today's video. I'm Javon Harrington with Power Core Productions and Podcastings. Signing off, and I'll see you next time.